dot. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you again on our European Tensor Network colloquium series. So um, today we have Mike Zanetel from UC Berkeley. Um, he has been working on uh, Tensor Networks for a very long time um, since he kind of basically started uh, his PhD and has done actually very original and, uh, and nice uh, contribution. Has made made like very 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 original contributions to the uh, to the field, and therefore it's uh, it's great to uh, to hear something today that is also sounds very original and new. Universal tripartite entanglement in CFTs and topological phases. So please, Mike. Great. Thanks, Frank and Frank and Norbert for having me here. Uh, so this is work that's in progress, but at least the first half of it on the CFTs should be posted next week. Um, it was collaboration with uh, Yi John Zhu, who's actually a Gifri student. I know Gifri's here in the audience, who's currently at Perimeter, but moving to a combination of Stanford and Google X. Uh, my two students, Kartik and Tomo at Berkeley, and Roger Mong at the University of Pittsburgh, who also helped me put together these slides. So thanks to him for that. Uh, and all the numerics I'm going to show you, John, did using uh, large scale matrix product state calculations, which are quite impressive. I wish I had a little bit more time to go into technically how he does it. It's just going to come out of thin air, but they're quite impressive. Um, so we probably don't need, well, I mean, to motivate tripartite entanglement, let me give a brief review of bipartite entanglement. Um, one interesting thing about it is that, so, you know, when I say bipartite, I mean, we're looking at uh, properties of a pure state on two parties or equivalently a mixed state on one party. Um, and bitartite entanglement uh, is essentially uniquely characterized by the entanglement entropy um, that we're all familiar with. And the reason for this is at least in the asymptotic limit, if you take many copies of a state, uh, you can show that up to local operations and classical communication, the bell pair uh, is basically the, the, uh, the unique type uh, of entanglement. So you can think of the bell pair as kind of the the stem cell for uh, two-party correlations from which uh, um, any state can be made up of. Uh, if you only have one copy of the state, it's a little more uh, subtle. It's basically that the entanglement spectrum, the whole Schmidt spectrum, uh, is the unique invariant or equivalently uh, the set of all rel uh, alpha Renyi entropies. Um, bipartite entanglement has certainly proved useful. There's sort of two directions uh, of interest in many body physics. One is you can use it to detect what some sort of phase you're in. Uh, the basic setup is you imagine that uh, your two parties are actually two regions of space. And we're quite familiar that you have an area law, but then there can be certain uh, features, uh, quantitative features of it, which can reveal what type of phase of matter you're in. And of course, for this audience, it's also important that the area law at least lower bounds the difficulty of doing tensor network calculations. Uh, within the geometry of something like PEPs or MPS because it uh, sets the bond dimensions you need. Um, so let me give some examples of that. Um, the formulas that are going to be relevant here are, of course, if you look at the entanglement of a segment of the ground state of a conformal field theory and the segment has length L, uh, then there's a logarithmic divergence whose prefactor is the central charge. Uh, now, one interesting thing that shows up here is you can see that entanglement in this case is both UV and IR divergent uh, because you have this length uh, over A here. Uh, in 2D, if you have a gap topological phase and cut out a disk uh, of radius L, uh, then there's the, of course, the area law part, which is non-universal, uh, but then Kataev and Preskul and Levin and Wen uh, showed there's the subleading term, the topological entanglement entropy gamma. Uh, which detects if there's fractionalization, so uh, anionic quasi-particles. Uh, and similar formulas have been uh, worked out in 2 plus 1D and for Fermi liquids uh, for other universal signatures. Okay, so how does it show up for the difficulty of tensor network simulations? Uh, well, we know that if you have a tensor network state, uh, I'm not considering like MERA, uh, but if you have MPS or PEPs, like a sort of Cartesian geometry, uh, then tensor network implies area law, and the coefficient of the area law is bounded by the log of bond dimension. Um, it's natural to ask where the, air, the arrow goes the other way. Does area law improve, uh, imply tensor network? Uh, there's a really nice work by Frank essentially showing that this is true. Uh, in particular, if you can show that there's an area law, not for the von Neumann entropy, but for all the alpha Renyi entropies less than one, uh, then you can show there's an MPS representation uh, whose fidelity 
uh, improves faster than any power law with a bond dimension. So it's not necessarily exponential, but it's better than any power law. Uh, so in that sense, in 1D, um, at least at the level of folklore, we can say that area law is actually equivalent uh, to a tensor network representation. Uh, but this is certainly not true once you go to 2D and higher. You can easily write down area law states, uh, which uh, provably don't have PEPs representations. I'm sure there's an earlier version of this than this Iser paper, but um, uh, uh, they showed an even more uh, powerful version of this, that the area law uh, space is extremely large. Uh, so it's natural to then ask if in 2D area law doesn't imply PEPs representation, is there some other entanglement measure, perhaps going beyond bipartite entanglement, uh, that would allow or guarantee a PEPs representation? And I, I don't claim to have proved that yet. I mean, it's barely starting, but this was kind of my motivation uh, for starting to think about multi-party entanglement measures. Um, it will be useful to have in mind uh, a particular case, uh, which is the physics of the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, so this is a 2D phase of matter. It's gapped in the bulk. Uh, but if it has an edge, like on this um, rectangular geometry here, uh, you get a set of uh, gapless edge states. You can quantify the number of those edge states uh, via the chiral or via the central charge, and you'll find that the central charge for the right movers uh, has a mismatch from the, the central charge of the left movers. And this difference, C right minus C left, is the so-called chiral central charge. Um, so integer quantum Hall isn't the only case. Other examples are uh, various fractional quantum Hall effects, P plus IP superconductors, et cetera. So all these are examples of uh, gapped chiral topological orders. So there's kind of been a folklore in the field uh, going back to the last decade or so, which is that if you have a 2D gapped phase with chiral edge states, uh, it doesn't admit a fixed bond dimension PEPs representation in the thermodynamic limit. Um, there are states people have discussed as chiral PEPs, they do have, for instance, a chiral entanglement spectrum, but when you look at them closely, uh, you actually find they have algebraic correlations, uh, so they shouldn't be the ground states of gapped Hamiltonians with um, uh, local interactions. So a version of this statement has actually been proved for Gaussian PEPs or pre-fermion uh, PEPs by uh, Jerome uh, and Nick Reed back in 2015, but uh, in general, at least I'm not aware of any uh, further progress on trying to prove this. Now, the integer quantum Hall effect definitely has an area law. So it's natural to ask, is there some entanglement measure you can use to detect that a state has chiral edge states or a chiral central charge? And then might it be that that particular entanglement invariant is actually the obstruction uh, to forming a PEPs? So uh, the bipartite entanglement entropy is, certainly isn't good enough. If you look at the integer quantum Hall effect, it doesn't have any anions. So this gamma, the topological entanglement entropy is zero. Um, you might say, oh, can I take linear combinations of like SAB minus SA or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, all of them only review gamma in terms of their universal content. So uh, the linear combination won't work, work either. And now some of you might know that there is something you can uh, sort of detect these chiral edge states with, and that's the uh, entanglement spectrum. So if you have your density matrix uh, for a subsystem, and you look at the eigenvalues, that's the Schmidt spectrum, um, if you have symmetries in your problem, in particular translation symmetry or angular momentum, uh, then you can plot these uh, Schmidt states versus uh, the quantum number they carry under that symmetry. So the typical way you do this makes these famous pictures where the the x-axis is the momentum of the Schmidt state, and the y-axis is the resulting Schmidt value, uh, then you actually see that the spectrum looks similar to that of the edge. This was observed by Lee and Haldane, who's also pointed out earlier by Kataev and Preskill. Um, so if you see that there's a kind of dispersion relation which moves rightward, uh, that would seem to indicate that it's chiral. Um, but just looking at it is not the kind of measure we want, though, because, I mean, I can tell you, if you look at generic quantum Hall systems, which aren't like, you know, ground states of the model Hamiltonians, the spectra look like a mess and it can actually be very difficult to even tell whether it's a right mover or a left mover, you know, so we actually want some like quantitative uh, invariants. Um, there are some proposals for these. So this was work with Frank Roger and I, and then from Xiaoyang Chi's group um, uh, called the, well, uh, basically we show that given the combined data of the Schmidt spectrum, 
and these quantum numbers, it appears that you can uh, detect the chiral central charge, at least modulo 24. Um, but to me, for the purpose of like using this as a starting point for maybe saying uh, something about PEPs, I don't find this satisfactory. One, because you need translation symmetry to even define these quantities. Um, but like the sort of obstruction shouldn't really matter whether there's some disorder in the lattice or something like that. So we, we want some entanglement measure that doesn't require symmetry. Um, and it also detects it only mod 24. Um, so you'd just be silent in the case of a state with chiral central charge 24. But most likely, if this folklore is true, the chiral central 24 phase also doesn't have a PEPs representation. Um, um, so these particular measures wouldn't actually uh, reveal the obstruction for that. OK, so this is just to say why I think um, uh, it would be interesting to go beyond bipartite entanglement uh, and looking for chiral states. Oops. So the question I'm going to ask in this talk um, is whether we can find a tripartite entanglement measure, meaning a property of a pure state divided into three parties, ABC, uh, which detects the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, and we believe now that the answer is yes, actually. So that's what I'm going to get to. Um, so then the next stage of this program, and maybe you guys can help figure it out, I don't know the answer, is whether you can show that there's no way that a PEPS can actually uh, have a near non-zero measure for this tripartite entanglement measure. So that's the motivation for the talk. Um, now, OK, so outline of the talk, I've been talking about 2D the entire time. But it turns out to, uh, to develop some intuition for the measure uh, I'm going to discuss, it's going to help to actually start out by discussing its application to 1D spin chains in detail. Uh, and this measure we're going to discuss provides uh, a UV independent uh, multi-party entanglement measure for spin chains. Um, and we're going to show it detects if and only if a 1D system is gapped. And furthermore, in the case when it's gapless, uh, it directly gives uh, the central charge. So that's what I'm going to start out by discussing. OK, so first, as I said, what are we looking for? We're looking for a tripartite entanglement measure. So it's a measure either of a density matrix on two parties or a pure state on three parties. The two pictures are related by purification. Um, and unlike bipartite case, where the von Neumann entropy is kind of the unique way of measuring entanglement, because bell pairs are really the only sort of entanglement, uh, three parties is entirely different. We believe that there is no like stem cell, there's no like one type of state which can be converted uh, with quantum operations, reversible quantum operations uh, into a generic three party state. Um, so correspond, you know, so examples are GHZ state, W state, et cetera. Um, they can't be converted into each other. Um, so given that there's many different types of tripartite entanglement. Correspondingly, there's many different uh, three-party entanglement measures which have been proposed, like uh, entanglement of purification, negativity, uh, et cetera. Um, one of them, maybe I wouldn't call it an entanglement measure, but uh, at least a measure of correlations is, of course, the mutual information. Uh, it's just the familiar generalization from the same notion in classical information theory. Um, it's sufficient to detect, for instance, uh, uh, if a density matrix is a product state. So the mutual information between two parties is zero, uh, if and only if uh, it's a product state. And many body systems is a nice geometric interpretation for what IAB does. So if we assume that our system obeys an area law, which anything but a Fermi surface does in 2D, we believe, uh, then a schematic representation for the entanglement you get for a region A is just, uh, say, the highlighted region uh, which is proportional to the boundary. Um, so we can easily roughly estimate what the mutual information is between two regions. And you get a cancellation of terms except for uh, the line segment at their interface. So you expect that mutual information between two parties in this case uh, just extends extensively uh, with the boundary between them. If you go on to two regions which don't touch, you get very different behavior if it's gapped or gapless. If it's gapped, then up to exponential uh, corrections, you expect that there's no mutual information between them. Uh, if it's gapless, uh, you'll get some power law dependence in the mutual information, depending on the details of the geometry. Uh, and that's necessary because mutual information is known 
uh, to lower bound the existence of correlations. So if you have gapless power laws, there needs to be mutual information. Um, but certainly the mutual information, if you look at something like the integer quantum Hall effect, either gives a completely non-universal number, say in this setup here, or it gives up to exponential correction zero in the uh, non-contiguous setup. Um, so it's not useful for that purpose. Sorry, Mike, can I ask a small question? So if yeah. you have symmetry breaking, then you can be capped, of course, but 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 the mutual information wouldn't be non-zero at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that's right. So this should be gapped and no long range order. Um, that, that actually, um, that's gonna, feature importantly in the measure I'm going to talk about. So the measure I'm going to talk about will give zero for a gap phase, even if it's a cat state uh, with long range order, which is interesting. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. OK, so what's the setup for this measure? Um, the measure is called the reflected entropy. Um, I think it was only I mean, it's a simple quantity. It was only defined last year in the context of holography. I'll give a little bit more uh, background about that in a second. So, uh, but the starting point for it is if you want to measure the reflected entropy, first need to define a purification. Um, so purification is just starting from a density matrix, row A, you construct a pure state uh, on an enlarged Hilbert space where you add an ancilla, the purifying party C, and the only requirement is that that pure state, when you trace out C, you get back the, uh, the reduced density matrix. So this, of course, is a many to one mapping. There's many purifications for a given density matrix uh, because the tracing out uh, means that the purification doesn't care if you apply any unitary operation to C, okay? Uh, so there's a many to one procedure, uh, but there's a particular canonical choice uh, which shows up, for instance, in modular theory uh, that I'll call here the canonical purification. Um, and in the canonical purification, we choose the ancilla party C uh, to be a mirror image uh, of the original state that you're purifying. So I'll call it A bar. And the way you construct it is very simple. Uh, you just take the square root of the density matrix. So if we start out with the eigen decomposition uh, for the density matrix on the lower left, then the pure state you get by turning uh, the bra into a ket the purifying party and then taking the square root of the eigenvalues. Um, in the constants of statistical mechanics, um, where if what you're looking at is a thermal state, uh, this would be called the thermofield double state. So in the case where you start out with row AB on two parties, of course, canonical purification goes through the same way. You just look at the square root of the density matrix. Uh, and in this paper by uh, Dutta and Faulkner in 2019, they define the reflected entropy to be the von Neumann entropy of the canonical purification uh, for the density matrix. And when I say the von Neumann entropy, it's the entropy of A, A bar uh, relative to B, B bar. So uh, if there's any questions about that, maybe I'll pause here on the definition. Let's draw a picture of it. So if we start out, let's say in 1D with a quantum spin chain, and I'm looking at the density matrix for these two spa spatial regions, row AB, then the picture I'm gonna draw for the canonical purification, it's now a pure state that lies on four parties. Uh, the barred parties are mirror images uh, of the original ones. Uh, so it's natural to kind of think of it as being a pure state which lies on a ring in 1D, and that's how I'll draw it. And then the reflected entropy is then just the bipartite entanglement entropy for the ring or a cut like this. Okay, so that's the definition of the reflected entropy. Um, why were, just for some background, why were they thinking about this uh, in the high energy literature? It came from holography uh, and the ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, so, probably several of you, most of you are familiar with. Uh, uh, the Ru Takianagi formula, uh, which relates what's the von Neumann entropy of a region on the boundary in the CFT. Uh, it relates it to a ge geometric quantity uh, in the bulk, you know, the gravitational bulk. And the relation is just that entanglement is equal to surface area. So, uh, one question people have been wondering about. Um, is there's a geometric feature which shows up all the time called the entanglement wedge cross-section. 
Um, so it takes the following form. Suppose this is the boundary down here and you have two parties A and B. Um, the area which is relevant for um, computing the entropy of A and B is to look at this blue region here. It's the minimal volume uh, whose boundary terminates on AB. And then if you look at the surface area of it, which would be the dark blue area, uh, then that surface area is what gives you uh, the entanglement entropy of AB. Uh, but the region included in all of it is called the entanglement wedge. Um, so one thing people have been wondering about is what is the dual quantity to the so-called entanglement wedge cross-section, which is defined as the minimal cut you can make across the entanglement wedge, which disconnects party A from party B. So I'll call that minimal cross-section uh, sigma minimal. Uh, then it's natural to define the area of it in units of Newton's constant, and this gives uh, a dimensionless, well, I'm setting h bar equal to one, uh, and this gives something uh, in dimensionless units of, say, qubits. So, so Mike, maybe I have a small question. So, yeah. is it obvious that this um, um, that this that this quantity is spaces independent in the sense that if I the, the eigenvalue decomposition is not unique if I have a degeneracy of eigenvalues? Yeah, and, and it's not entirely obvious to me that this um, quantity does not depend on how you will actually choose that. I can find the composition. Let me think about it. So you're saying, so, I mean, the definition is basically the unique positive, you know, when I write this, it's the unique positive semi-definite uh, square root. But if I have degeneracies, this is not unique. Ah, uh, let me think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, so you're saying if you have a degeneracy, then you can have a unitary uh, operation on AB acting in that just in that degenerate space and a priori that would change the entanglement between a a bar and b b bar but, but wouldn't you have a maximally entangled state on this degenerate space in the end if you purify which which then would be uh, basis independent again starting from starting from which one that's not obvious at least no that's uh I don't know. It, it it feels like in the subspace it's maximally entangled, right? So 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 it shouldn't really matter in which basis you do it if it's maximally entangled. Yeah, that that's that 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 might be true. That's a good point. Well, I, I don't immediately see. I mean, Norbert, you're saying if you have a a degeneracy. I mean, there's two cases. If you had a full degeneracy in the entire spectrum, then that would be true. But if you just have like a single degenerate doublet, you can't isolate from that a qubit, which is fully entangled, can you? I wouldn't think so, because you don't really have a tensor product structure there. Mm. Maybe we all think about that. <laughs> yeah, I need to think, but I hadn't thought, I mean, it doesn't really show up generically in any of the cases I've looked at. Um, and the measure I'm eventually going to ascribe for 2D is defined in a way where it clearly needs to be invariant under small deformations. But, but the star you had earlier was a complex conjugate. So it's really defined by not taking the same system, but the complex conjugate state. Um, yeah, so if... Uh, that could be relevant, actually, for something like that. Yeah, I need to think about that. But... Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Frank. I need to think more about that. So what what um, they showed in this work is at least at large n, um, the entanglement wedge cross section is dual to this reflected entropy. Uh, I had learned about this because I was before this paper, I had been uh, thinking about this problem and with Brian Swingle, we had conjectured that the entanglement wedge cross section is dual to a different multi-party entanglement measure, which is the uh, entanglement of purification, uh, which you know, Frank has written papers on. Um, the current thinking is probably both of them are true at large n, um, uh, but not when you look at subleading corrections. Okay, so. SR itself, the reflected entropy, um, for instance, in a CFT, you would find it has a kind of log L over A type divergence. It's sensitive to UV physics. Um, so 
in the rest of the discussion, it's actually going to be much nicer to define this quantity that very uncreatively I'll call H, which is the difference between these two measures. It's the reflected entropy minus the mutual information. And the claim is that it's this H thing, which is actually going to be a nice universal, universal uh, UV invariant um, measure of tripartite entanglement. So if I write it out in terms of this picture um, acting on the canonical purification, uh, it's this particular ratio of entropies um, shown here. Uh, we'll rearrange this into a bit more intuitive form in just a bit. Mike, is it, is it more symmetric than it looks like? Uh, it is, and I'll get back to that because B is the same as B bar, for instance. So where you currently see SB, you could replace that with SB bar. Uh, I'll come back to this, and that makes it look much nicer. It's, it's actually the conditional mutual information between A bar and B conditioned on A. So I'll, I'll come back to that. It's also, um, it's not symmetric in the sense that if you started with the pure state uh, ABC, there's no reason that this measure should be cyclic, like uh, HAB will not be the same as HBC. So it's not symmetric in that sense. Okay, so I wanna discuss some properties of it. Um, one will show that it's non-negative, so it's positive. Uh, I'm gonna argue that it vanishes for gapped 1D ground states, even if there's long range order. Um, uh, long range order here, I'm just calling a cat state. Um, and that if you look at a 1D CFT, it directly gives a universal value, which is the central charge without, without actually need to do scaling. It's not like a log divergence, it actually just gives it as a number. Okay, so let me walk through this. First, let's prove the non-negativity. Um, this is a consequence. Um, it, it, so it follows from a discussion in uh, Faulkner's original paper. Uh, so let me just remind you, strong subadditivity uh, tells you that this particular uh, gives you this inequality between um, different sums of uh, uh, entropies that can equivalently be phrased as the positivity of conditional mutual information. Uh, so how do I see that at play here? Um, well, what I can do is the fact that because this was a canonical purification, the party B is exactly identical to B par. They have the same reduced density matrix. So when I see B here, I can replace it with SB bar. And then because the state as a whole is pure, SB bar is the same as the entropy of A bar AB. So if I replace B with that formula there, uh, this particular combination is exactly the mutual information across the corners from A bar to B conditioned on the one in between. Uh, and strong subadditivity then implies that that's greater than or equal to zero, okay? Um, so this is nice, we have H uh, being a, a positive a positive quantity. So anytime we see a po an inequality in quantum information, just like the inequality of mutual information, it's interesting to ask, is there a structure theorem which um, categorizes the states for which H is equal to zero? Um, so we were able to derive such a structure theorem. Here's how it works. I'll phrase this structure as theorem as H is equal to zero if and only if gapped, but let me um, phrase what it is just in the context of uh, quantum mechanics rather than many body physics. Let me first uh, define a state to be a triangle state so this is a, I'm looking at a pure state on three parties. I mean, to define it to be a triangle state, uh, if it just looks like bell pairs uh, shared pairwise between the three parties. Um, so formally, um, how you would formalize that is each of the parties uh, has a decomposition as a tensor product into a left party and a right party, which you could think of as the two black dots. Uh, and then the global pure state just comes from a tensor product of bell pair like states or just a general bipartite uh, uh, state shared along the, the edges of the triangle. Uh, in the MPS language, uh, we're familiar with this. This is exactly the same as a matrix product state on three sites with zero correlation length. Um, so it's certainly a familiar idea uh, to many people. Does anyone know, does this have a fancier sounding name? Does 
Has anyone defined what you'd call this? Just a pairwise entangled state. Oh, a randomization group fixed point. Yeah, it's RG. Well, the interesting thing is this, as you point out, this isn't quite a RG fixed point because if you have a cat state on the ring, you'd kind of like that to be a fixed point. And indeed, if you have a matrix product state in the cat state, that's a fixed point, but it doesn't take this form here um, because you have like an overall GHZ character. Um, so that, that actually exactly motivates what I'm going to call a sum of triangle states and it takes the following form. First imagine, suppose you have a GHZ state on three parties, which I'm denoting mu, mu, mu. Um, and the sum, I mean, the GHZ state, mu would just run over one over two, but in general, you could consider a, um, a higher rank version of it. And then what I'm gonna do is for each uh, mu, I tensor product that with a triangle state where the particular triangle state can be conditioned on mu. So it, it's not an overall tensor product of GHZ and triangle. It's, the, it's a sum of triangle states conditioned um, on mu. Okay, so another way to think about that is what I'm now specifying is that each party A uh, can be factorized as a direct sum over sectors mu, and within each sector, it's a tensor product of a left party and a right party. Uh, and then the overall global state is just a superposition of triangle states indexed by mu. Now, this is actually what Frank points out is a fixed point. So if you have, you know, I learned about this from the, the Perez Garcia uh, overview article on uh, fixed points of MPS, canonical forms and fixed points of MPS. If you have a periodic MPS, uh, it can be at least at sufficient length scales, it can always be written as a sum of injective MPS. And then each MPS individually uh, has a fixed point representation, which is a triangle state. Uh, but generically, if you have a periodic MPS, um, you know, under coarse grading, it actually could flow to a sum of triangle states, this form on the right. So it basically means that if you have a periodic matrix product state, for example, um, and you use it to solve for the ground state of the Ising model but below the ferromagnetic um, phase transition, uh, it will have long range order, uh, which you can think of as a sum of two triangle states coming from the all up sector and the all down sector. Okay. So the claim that, so we're able to rigorously prove this is that a pure state has H equals zero if and only if uh, it's the sum of triangle states. Um, or as I would phrase it for this audience, it's a cat state of zero correlation length matrix product states. So why would I say this means H equals zero if and only if gapped? Well, it's really that if we believe that matrix product states uh, give efficient representations of gapped Hamiltonians, including on a periodic ring, um, under coarse graining, so looking at sufficiently large rings and making parties A, B, and C include many, many sites, we know all matrix product states flow with exponential accuracy to a fixed point matrix product state and any three site fixed point matrix product state is precisely uh, this sum of triangle states. So that's the logic here. So I think it's kind of nice that unlike mutual information, you know, another way you might try and detect a gap phase is to look at the mutual information between two disconnected regions. Uh, but as Frank pointed out, mutual information alone is sensitive to long range order. So you'd get, you know, log two or something um, in the ferromagnetic ground state of the Ising model um, on a large ring, uh, because it, strictly speaking, makes a superposition. Whereas H doesn't see that GHZ or CAT state-like uh, behavior and, and gives zero uh, despite, despite long range order. Any questions about this before I move on? So I won't prove it here, but the basic technical ingredient that goes into it is um, Hayden's structure theorem for, for quantum Markov chains, states which uh, uh, saturate strong subadditivity. Um, some of you might know that the, the 
form of uh, the structure theorem they develop involves the so-called splitting of a Hilbert space. So you can um, basically apply their reasoning uh, to a bunch of parties and then compare them and then you can show it takes some form like this. Okay, so if it's gapped, H is equal to zero. Uh, what if it's gapless and in particular a conformal field theory? So uh, I won't do the full proof. It actually follows from uh, the original Faulkner paper, though Roger came up with a nice way to prove it using much more elementary techniques. Um, so here's the argument. Let's consider the special case where the two parties you were starting with have the same length so A is equal to B, and that altogether they're half the chain, okay? And then I wanna compute what's H for region AB on the ground state of this ring. Well, the idea is the ground state itself, if you assume that there's some reflection symmetry, so that this, uh, the top half of the chain is just the mirror image of the bottom half of the chain, then the canonical purification for AB is just the ground state itself, where you just view party C as being split into A bar and B bar. Okay, so the canonical purification is the ground state itself. And then this problem of computing H just amounts to computing this particular um, uh, linear combination uh, of entropies, which we have a standard result in conformal field theory, which lets us do that, uh, which is. Um, uh, due to Cardi, Cardi, the entanglement of a segment. And if you just plug in the special case where each of these regions is one quarter, uh, you find that the order one term cancels, uh, which comes from the UV physics, and you just get that H is C over three log two without any scaling. Now here, this argument really only worked when A and B uh, were each one quarter of the chain. Um, but what you can show is that if you have a more general situation, that's parameterized by a cut at the boundary between A and C, between A and B, between B and C, that's like three points. Uh, what you can first do is apply a conformal transformation to map any three points uh, to the three points, uh, which are the special case, um, and then compute the entanglement. And you find uh, that due to conformal invariance, um, this particular ratio doesn't actually change. So the takeaway is that you get H is C over three log two regardless of the relative size of A, B, and C. There's just no length dependence whatsoever, uh, unlike bar pi tight entanglement, which uh, is extracted via scaling. So uh, this is kind of fun to think of in light of this structure theorem. So this structure theorem basically says H is equal zero if it can be represented by a matrix product state. Um, so the fact that H is not zero here is, you know, just makes explicit that when you move away from H equals zero, that's the obstruction, uh, to having a finite bond dimension matrix product straight structure in the thermodynamic limit. Okay. So just to summarize, we've discussed that H is a non-negative quantity. Uh, advantages for these special states, uh, polygon states, where I discuss it in the three-party case of triangle states, um, whereas for CFTs, it gives a universal value of C over three log two. How much time I have? Um, okay. Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, the, the result for the CFT, do you, is this universal or will this be susceptible to, well, if you just have a critical system with some non-universal UV features? Um, yeah, I'll show this numerically. The claim is that um, up to power, so if you did this, suppose you have arbitrary LA, LB, LC, the three lengths, then the form would be H is equal to C over three log two plus power law corrections um, in whatever the smallest length is. Um, okay. So like one over L squared convergence. Uh, but this is different. That's a different sort of UV dependence. It's, it's purely irrelevant. So as, as you take the thermodynamic limit, you just get this constant. Unlike bar pi, bar pi tight entanglement, where this order one um, is there, it can be thought of as from the fact that there's an ambiguity in uh, the units in which you measure distance. So there's like a log L over A. Uh, uh, Mike, I had a question. This Tarun, hi. Um, yeah. Hi, Tarun. Hi. 
Uh, just a naive question. Suppose you consider a one plus one D CFT, which also holds a topological order. So there is this possibility that a gauge theory in one plus one D can deconfine in the presence of gapless matter. For example, you can have Z2 topological order coexisting with a CFT. This is, mm -hmm. and we know models for this work by Martinich and collaborators. So there, it seems like looking at this, at least naively, I have not thought about it, obviously, but I, it looks like the, the universal log two cancels out because all it's an even number of terms with all of them have the same topology. Wait, let me understand topology. You mean like symmetry protected topology? No, 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 no. I mean the topology of the regions I'm here. I'm saying that, oh, I don't know. Oh, I, I'm saying, I'm just, uh, a, a bar and A, B and A and B all are just single segments. So it seems like that log two, the, which is, it's not, I'm not, not talking about SPT basis just to make sure I'm talking about a, this maybe not very well understood pace of matter, which is one plus yeah. one, the gapless uh, Z to topological order. Well, let me note that actually I did this a little bit too quickly. This computation that you get C over three log two requires A and B to touch. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do a different computation. If A and B are disconnected, then, uh, you know, so you could put an interval in right. between. Right then the H is actually sensitive to more than the central charge. I see. Um, I need to think about the general result there, but yeah, I should give a caveat that when I'm saying H is C over three log two, I mean that A and B are contiguous. Um, so when you talked about the topology, I now understand you meant the topology of what the regions A and B are. Right. Um, so we need to start thinking more generally than in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in possible fact. with some slightly different yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mike. I also have a small question. So, in yeah. your in your uh, picture, you assume that the this this A and A bar region together would basically form the ground state of the or of, of your of your CFT. But and is that is that completely obvious that that indeed these things, if you glue them to each other, the A and A bar parts, that that this is equivalent to to a segment of of a, uh, of, a of a chain that that does not involve somehow this conjugation. Um, yeah, so uh, is it fair to rephrase that is what condition do I need on the, like what symmetries do I need on the CFT here to ensure that just viewing the ground state as itself the canonical purification is correct? Yes. Because you need that this is like positive semi-definite square root. Yes. Uh, so let me think. I think Roger has thought, I forget which symmetry it is, but I think if there is, um, I don't remember if it was PT or, I actually don't remember off the top of my head, but he has a symmetry condition where that will be true. Um, but actually this proof, so this is a nice way of arguing it, um, but using the fact that it was proved by Dutta and Faulkner that um, SR is equal to two EW. Um, so, and, yeah, you can show, uh, this is actually how I did it the first time because I had been working on this entanglement wedge. Uh, this geometric thing uh, implies, implies this. Actually, uh, let me actually phrase that a different way. So the nice thing is that uh, because re reflected entropy is defined as the entropy of a square root of a density matrix, um, Square roots are something that we actually have a path integral formalism for if you do replication. So you take n copies of the CFT and then take the replica limit of n going to one half. So um, what Dutta and Faulkner do is they give a prescription for computing SR in a double replicated theory where you're doing one set of replicas to take the square root of the density matrix. And then you do another set of replicas to then compute von Neumann entropy. Uh, and it turns out that corresponds to some, you know, complicated Riemann surface coming from the double replication. Um, but that kind of picture, just like Calabresi and Cardi uh, exploited, uh, can then be used to compute SR from the data of the conformal field theory. And if you take their expressions uh, and look at the limit of the geometry I'm looking at here, it just gives H equals C over three log two. Um, so this is just to say there's a much more rigorous way to show this that doesn't require uh, assuming uh, some form of reflection symmetry such that this uh, canonical purification is the same as the ground state. Yeah. 
Okay, let's look at some numerics. Um, uh, Yijun did these by, you know, in work with Gifri, uh, they had developed uh, an efficient approach to getting matrix products ground states on rings. And uh, generally that's much more expensive than doing it on open systems or infinite chains, uh, but they have a nice uh, working code to do that. So they can get in matrix product state form the ground state of a CFT on rings up to say circumference 100 or so. So the model we then looked at, because we want to look into this question that Yutha raised of how do you know it's you know insensitive to UV physics, um, is this uh, model due to O'Brien and Paul Fenley, um, where you start out with the Ising model, which we can represent in this My Majorana representation on the left here. Uh, and then, you, so if you had the term on the left alone, you'd be at the, the critical point of the Ising model. Um, but then they showed that if you deform it with this term here, it no longer has all the integrable structure of the Ising model, um, but it stays exactly at the Ising critical point. So long as lambda is between zero and 0 0.428, uh, at that point, it becomes a C equals seven tenths critical, um, tricritical point. And then for larger lambda, uh, it's unstable and becomes gapped. So this gives a convenient way to introduce an irrelevant perturbation lambda um, while still saying exactly tuned to criticality. And what one would like to see is that H um, gives the universal value regardless of the parameter lambda until you hit the tricritical point. Um, so I will spare you the details of how exactly we're able to compute SR for large systems. Naively, it, it seems like it should be difficult. You need to take a many body density matrix and then take the square root uh, where the regions are you know, maybe 20 sites or so. Uh, but we were able to do this on periodic rings of up to circumference 100 or so. So the x-axis, uh, is showing the size of the system on which we extracted H. Um, the y-axis is H. And then the different curves are for the different values of lambda. So lambda equals zero is the exact Ising model. There doesn't seem to be any flow with system size at all. Um, and then as you add an irrelevant perturbation, so that's like, say, the green curve, then it decays as one over n squared um, to the universal constant. The decay, of course, becomes slow as you approach the tricritical point, let's say the blue curve. And then right when you're at the tricritical point, it jumps up uh, to a different value coming from the fact that the central charge has changed from one half uh, to seven tenths. Uh, so Yu John was able to do this for a bunch of different phases, uh, Ising CFT, tricritical, free boson at different compactification radius. Uh, and he found that the H measured uh, all extrapolates to C over three log two to within tenth of a percent or so. As an aside, I will comment on this column here. There's another quantity G, which we're just not defining. Uh, I didn't want to talk about it, uh, which is the entanglement of purification minus the mutual information, which is also apparently a universal uh, positive number. Uh, but I, so Mike, did, uh, did um, your student have to do some scaling to get these numbers or? or? It's exactly this scaling here. So he takes a ring of length n. But not uh, in the bond dimension. Oh, oh. Um, all the bond dimensions are, it, I mean, Yijun says all the bond, I mean, he, he checks bond dimension of MPS uh, and ensures that they're converged. Um, but I mean, that doesn't really take, to, like if you have a, um, a length 100 ring, the bond dimension is not actually that large. So that's not the difficulty. Um, the, the difficulty is then computing SR because you need to compute the entropy of a big region. So the bond dimensions here might be a couple hundred or so, and, and that's, that's fine for uh, th this size ring. I guess in principle, you could do this not on a ring, but on an infinite line using this kind of setup is just the special case where LC goes to infinity and you should still get H uh, over three C log two. And then you would need to worry about the bond dimension because you're, you're looking at a large system. Does that answer your question, Frank? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so this last part is kind of work in progress and there will not be a paper on it next week. And I would actually enjoy discussing it more with you guys and seeing 
what directions there are here. Um, and that's the application to 2D chiral phases. And here's the conjecture stated in English. If you look at this geometry here, so I have a pure state. I imagine C uh, extends out to infinity, so I'm on the plane, but it doesn't really matter. This could also be on a sphere or on a torus, uh, but something with no edges, so that we're just in the bulk. Uh, and then I separate out two touching parties, A and B in the bulk. And then you can compute HAB just as in 1D, it's defined the same way. Then the conjecture is that a gap 2D phase has an irremovable H, if and only if uh, the phase of matter uh, has an edge which is ungappable. So an example of an ungappable edge is of course, uh, if you have chiral topological order. Um, the reason I say ungappable is we now know there's work due to Michael Levin and others, which shows that there's certain topological orders which don't have a chiral central charge, but for uh, due to reasons concerning the anion content, they still have an edge which is ungappable. Um, so we would also believe that would have a irremovable age. Okay, so uh, the thing I need, the detail I need to get into though, is what I mean by irremovable. And the problem is, if you just define H in the naive way, where you just compute H of this setup, uh, suppose someone comes along and puts some dirt somewhere near the trisection of A, B, and C. There's two of them, where the parties A, B, and C get close to each other. Well, if you just put some dirt there, um, I don't know, maybe you just tensor product in a small, completely random three-party state uh, and localize it near the trisection there, H will detect that. Um, so in this setup, H is sensitive to UV details at the trisection, so itself cannot be universal. The reason this didn't show up in 1D is because when you look at the A, B, and C, uh, they never uh, all meet at one point. So when you do any local deformation, like you know, at this juncture, this juncture, this juncture, it changes SR and I independently, but this H, SR minus I, ends up being insensitive to that, uh, and so it doesn't change it. Um, uh, but now we have a trisection we have to take care of here. So it's not very practical to do, but here's the idea. So the idea, what I mean by irremovable H is suppose what you let yourself do is you start out with a product state A, B, C, and then you choose two regions around the trisection on the order of a correlation length, and you allow yourself to act with a unitary operators uh, localized near the trisection, okay? So of course, that shouldn't change what phase of matter you're looking at uh, or any of the universal entanglement properties uh, so long as you, know, you take the limit of all the sizes becoming uh, large uh, compared to the correlation length while keeping uh, the region in which you do these U's uh, comparable to the correlation length. OK, so then what we're going to define the irremovable H to be, to be the minimal value of H over all possible unitaries you could apply at the trisection. Uh, the IR, I guess, can either stand for irremovable or, or infrared. And so the precise claim we want to make um, is that if you could do this minimization problem, um, then the resulting value of H will be C over 3 log 2 plus exponentially small corrections in the lengths of various segments, where C is the minimal possible central charge uh, consistent uh, with that bulk topological order. So that's the claim. Maybe any, any questions before I proceed to an argument for why this should be the case? Okay. So here's a kind of hand-waving argument for why this should be true. Um, let's do a warm-up where you know, in this geometry, I said it's like an infinite plane or a sphere where there's no physical edges. But let's instead consider a modified geometry where I take the 2D system on an annulus um, so that in the white regions in the interior and exterior, I turn on a different type of mass term where it's in a trivial phase and the non-trivial phase is only in this annular region. And then I'll partition it into ABC like this. Uh, and we know as a consequence of there being an edge, uh, if it was ungappable, say chiral, there'd be some chiral edge states denoted in red there. Okay, so what is the H for this? Well, we can just do a dimensional reduction. We can view this annulus as a 1D ring with three parties A, B, C. 
Uh, and when you glue together under this dimensional reduction, the right mover in the interior of the annulus and the left mover at the exterior, together that gives a non-chiral CFT. So as a 1D phase of matter, this is just a conformal field theory and we should get H is equal to C over three log two. And you can confirm this numerically in something like the integer quantum Hall effect. That's indeed what you get. Now, the other ingredient I need is that because this is a chiral edge, suppose I allow myself to act with a unitary only in the interior here. This unitary can't gap out the edge because it's chiral. Only if the unitary could act jointly on the interior and exterior could you. So what we expect is no matter what unitary you apply uh, in the center here, there's no way you could get lower than C over three log two uh, in the value of H because you can't gap out the interior. So if we put these two principles together, this is actually enough to prove what we want. Let's start from this situation here and note that by construction, because H is defined as a minima over all local unitaries applied, if I apply any local unitary near the trisection, by definition, H doesn't change because you could always undo that during the minimization criteria, um, during the minimization step. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose this unitary uh, to shrink the annulus a little bit. You could think of that as just like an adiabatic time evolution if you want, where you just uh, you know, change your physical coupling constants to uh, grow the topological region at the expense of the trivial region. Um, so there's really no problem in doing this. You could use a unitary to shrink uh, the size of the center and you just keep going and eventually you can actually just make it disappear. So this setup on the right should have the same uh, irremovable H as the setup on the left. Um, but the exact same argument applies to the exterior. Uh, it's topologically the same. Uh, so by applying a unitary on the exterior edge, I can start growing it like this and just keep going and take this edge out to infinity. So altogether, those two processes is topologically the same as this setup here. You view the bottom trisection, or sorry, the top trisection as like the interior of the annulus and the bottom trisection is the exterior of the annulus. Uh, and the growing I was talking about is just the application of those two unitaries. Uh, so by that reasoning, we can map this situation to the annulus situation where we know we get C over three log two. And that's at least the hand-waving argument uh, for this conjecture here. So is it true? Well, unfortunately, um, I don't know how to numerically test it in general because it's a ridiculously difficult quantity to compute because you need to compute this many body entanglement measure minimized over unitary operations near the cut. So it's a very complex optimization problem. So if you ask me, what is it for you know, the fractional quantum Hall effect? Uh, I don't know at the moment. Um, but amazingly, um, Yijian was able to work out that if ABC is a free fermion state, uh, for instance, is the integer quantum Hall effect or a churn insulator, it's actually completely tractable to do this nonlinear optimization problem numerically for quite large lattices. You could do like a 50 by 50 lattice. So what he did is he just used nonlinear conjugate gradient, for instance, uh, to do this minimization problem of, over all unitaries. Uh, and he found that if you didn't have these two disentanglers, H was just some random non-universal number. But as he let the size of these regions grow, during the minimization, the H would always uh, reduce to this non-universal value, which we found to be the absolute value of the churn number of the band uh, times three log two to within a couple percent or so. Um, so at least for the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, this conjecture appears to be correct that it gives a universal measure uh, directly sensitive to the chiral central charge, because in these systems, the churn number is the chiral central charge. Um, so that's our evidence so far, a uh, hand-waving argument and um, this numerical proof for free fermion phases. Okay, so just to summarize um, this quantity H we've discussed, uh, in 1D, we can fairly rigorously establish that H is equal to zero if and only if you have a fixed point MPS, which we can interpret as being a gap ground state, uh, whereas for a CFT, you get C over three log two, 2D, this is more at the level of a conjecture uh, of the form here, uh, but we have been able to numerically uh, verify it uh, for integer quantum Hall effect for churn insulators. 
So going back to PEPs, this really is just a future direction that I think would be really cool to explore. I don't have particularly well-developed ideas at the moment, but I mean, the general set of ideas we have here is that we have a prediction for a purely bulk entanglement measure that detects whether a phase of matter has ungappable edges. Um, so far, all discrete PEPs, just meaning PEPs you know, on a discrete grid, have gappable edges. So this could all fit together where hopefully the, what we'll eventually be able to prove is that gapped PEPs, if and only if the 2D of phase of matter has ungappable edges, which is just equivalent to that a PEPs is possible if H, uh, this irreducible H is equal to zero. Um, so this is kind of the conjecture that I think would be interesting to prove. Can you show from the structure of the PEPs not only that it has an area law, but that it's always guaranteed uh, to have uh, an irremovable of H equal to zero. So it doesn't have more non-trivial tripartite entanglement than just a matrix product state can. Um, and this to me seems potentially easier to prove than directly showing that PEPs can't be chiral, where you define chiral from the edge, uh, because that's a statement about the spectrum um, or like the properties of the parent Hamiltonian which just seems much more awkward to work with than just directly trying to uh, prove uh, a property of the bulk entanglement. Uh, and likewise, you don't need um, symmetry as we did for the entanglement spectrum. Um, and that just seems like a more generic starting point. Um, so I'd be happy to discuss you know, ideas in this direction with all of you. Um, the current way we're thinking about it is in terms of these isometric tensor networks that Frank Pullman and I had been working on, um, where it seems that you can at least go part way uh, towards computing H in a, in a tractable way, at least certainly numerically. So that's what we're working on at the moment. Okay, is there any, any, any questions? That's the end. Well, let me first thank you for this great talk, Mike. Yeah. Um, Maybe I can start with a question if no, because it doesn't seem that people people still need some time to uh, digest this uh, these ideas. So what happens if you do if you calculate um, this in the last part this this thing for 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 a string net? Is that obvious that this is quantity h is zero if you if you start from um, with this? Yeah, like good question. Kind of so uh, I believe the answer is yes. So Tomo and Kartik were working on this. Um, and they find you don't need to do the disentangling. Indeed, indeed, because you're already in, in correlation like zero, basically. No? Yes, so you, and you just get H is equal to zero. Yeah. You, you get this. Yeah. yeah, I think it follows from like in your language where you have this kind of like MPO, um, I forget what you call it, but the, yeah, like the kind of MPO that would grew the left and the right. So, I mean, the key thing of this structure theorem is that uh, the structure theorem basically says that if you have a fixed point MPS, then H is equal to zero for two contiguous regions. So um, the MPOs you'd be talking about there sh should be at fixed points. Um, so you, it just follows that they have H equals zero. So that's the kind of idea that goes into it. Yeah. Because the idea would be, again, if you have, it, it, you want to use the same trick as we did here. If you have the peps on a plane, you'd like to view, as long as you have reflection symmetry, you could view the ground state as itself the canonical purification um, using the same mirror image idea. So then, like similar in you know, to work of Norbert's and so on, the, the central column, which ties together the left and right, can be understood as a reduced representation uh, of the uh, the canonical purification, then. So that's the kind of reasoning. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a couple of questions. Can I ask them? Or, yeah. or um, go ahead. One question. Hey. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, actually, I'm I'm I'm, I'm double zooming on a, I'm on a faculty meeting, but I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, so going back to the holographic, this conjecture you mentioned, is it true if I go beyond one over n, is it now believed that this wedge is 
is more the reflected entropy and not the entanglement purification or, or we still don't know the answer? That's my understanding that, so they're able to give the reflected entropy as, as a conformal blocks, like an expression. Um, so it's like a real calculation and then they conclude this is true. I see. Like our conjecture with the entanglement of purification and the related work by um, Takianagi, like, there wasn't, there wasn't really a proof of that. I mean, we kind of had a tensor network picture for why it was true and it obeyed the correct inequalities, but it wasn't a rigorous derivation. Um, this is actually a real computation. I see, I see, I see. And, 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 and one last question, if I, can you relate your quantity to, um, if I have a two plus one DCFT, can you show that at a fixed point it's, um, it's F? Oh, I have no idea. That's a great question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that H is certainly, well, okay. So one thing, one idea I would appreciate, like this setup is kind of terrible because you have to do this minimization. But if we did the, do this for a 2D gapless CFT, um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I don't know whether to expect a constant or something that scales with the size of A, B, and C. Interesting question. That we can figure out. But um, okay. But one, one very last big question: If I think of the C, you calculate as a as a C function along the RG flow. Is it? Yeah. Does it have all the properties of the zeromological C function? Like, is it stationary also? And um, it's not just equal to, but uh, there's an additional property of the slope, the way it approaches. The, uh, let me see. I think. Let me see. Because one of the issue with F theorem was it's the F they defined wasn't, or the, or the, for example, the Cassini here at a C function doesn't, I think, have that. Yeah. Problem. So, yeah. I believe in everything I know, and I have some intuition for this, that if, if you had the translation invariant system, and well, it's a, it's a little bit subtle to know how to do it, but may, maybe the easiest way to set that up is. Rather than working on a ring, let LC be infinitive, and then compute HAB for this setup, and ask how it scales as A and B increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I um, it's possible. So numerically, we've always seen it be monotonic. I see. I see. Um, as to whether you can prove it, I don't immediately think it follows from strong subadditivity, but I'm not sure. I see. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. But yeah, it's not just, um, I mean, there, there are several things. It's monotonic, and then it is also stationary, which is additional property. Which is, it's not just equal to C, but the way slope is zero or something. Yeah. And the, yeah. Anyway, OK. But yeah, this it, is a lot of food, food for thought right now. As a, it might be true system. that if you assume, like, let's say it is gapped, mm -hmm. and then you assume that the state is uh, an injective MPS, Mm -hmm. For instance, translation. I'm not, I think you might be able to prove, I can see how you would go about it, proving that it flows monotonically to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I wouldn't have an idea because I don't think strong subadditivity implies this for a, like a C general or a CFT. Um, I see, I see, I see. It may be interesting to look, look, look for this quantity in the Cassini here, it has set up in space time rather than just in space. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is very, very great. This is very, very nice. Thank you. Um, or do you have any other questions? So the, the intuition you gave for the conjecture in 2D kind of relied on having chiral edge states. So what's the intuition for these other cases you mentioned where you don't have a chiral central charge? Uh, well, it's always that the, the if, if so, if you put one of these states with an ungappable edge on the annulus, um, so example, I think is the new equals two thirds state. Um, there'll be a right mover and a left mover. So the chiral central charge is zero. There'll still be a net central charge though, that can't be zero. Um, I see. So when you combine the two edges, it's still a CFD and you can still apply the 1D. Yeah. It's just somehow more subtle there what it is. It has to do with the actual um, operator content for why, even though it's not chiral, there's no way to uh, gap out one edge in isolation. It has to do with these 
physics of Lagrangian subgroups, uh, which ends up being related uh, to what orders have quantum double models, which we then have like string net constructions for, and therefore PEPs. So all these th things seem to be related, ungappable edges, Lagrangian subgroups, string nets, and PEPs. I see. Thanks. Um, I see that here we can Jim try to say something or, or okay now. So maybe I have another, another question. You said that it was hard to actually calculate the um, entanglement entropy for these regions um, uh, as a function of the, of the system size, but I don't quite understand this. If you have an MPS, you can always calculate. If you have an MPS description of something, it's very easy to calculate the entanglement entropy. It just costs oh, yeah. you basically something that scales in the bond dimension, but not in the, in the size of the block. Yeah, no, I agree. So it's in the end, the effort to compute this was, uh, uh, chi to the fifth. I, if chi is the bond dimension, then it's it, it's easy in the sense that it's a polynomial. It's chi yeah, to it's the, only chi to the four. Uh, uh, I need to think about that. Um, although maybe chi to the fifth. Yeah, like chi to the fifth is probably okay. Yes, indeed, you're probably right. And then another thing. So, so I, I was a bit confused how your measure is different than the mutual than the conditional mutual information. You you, you talked about this well, before. Yes. Yeah, so. Because there are lots of structure theorems known for conditional mutual. If this is zero, then indeed there basically exists something like a Markov chain, and that means that indeed there is an MPS. I mean, there there yeah. are lots of theorems about this, and I'm, I was not quite sure how this. Yeah, it's related to that. So H is equal to zero uh, if and only if the canonical purification uh, is a Markov chain for any three consecutive parties. Okay. Because we said here that after doing the canonical purification, uh, the HAB can be rewritten as the canonical, sorry, the conditional mutual information like corner wise. Um, so um, we know that if you have, well, the usual Markov condition for like, like in the Dave Poulon works and so on would be that, um, well, yeah, I mean, that geometry is slightly different than what they had called the Markov trees or chains because um, yeah, because there what they say is there needs to be like a tree structure where if you make any cut uh, conditioned on that cut, it's a Markov chain ABC. This, this is just like a loop version of it. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but in, indeed, the way we prove this structure theorem, I mean, in the end, it, it's certainly all the hard work was done by Hayden, was showing that it's a mark because it's a Markov chain on any three parties. You just do a consistency check. We're demanding it's a Markov on any three parties. You then show it um, takes this form here. Um, yes. I mean, it's a maybe a couple pages, but it's the. I mean, you're absolutely right that the structure theorem for conditional mutual information is the actual non-trivial part. Um, so, I mean, to phrase it differently, suppose you had a pure state on four parties and you knew it was a Markov chain for any three. Um, you you then need to to show it takes this form here. Okay, Mike. I think you're. Um... This was a great talk, so let's upload. <laughs> <laughs>